Good morning, noon or night, wherever and whenever you're listening, you're listening to The Shift. I'm your host. My name is Doug McKenty. This is episode 40 of The Shift. It's being recorded on July 5th, 2018. If you like what you're listening to, please think about becoming a patron. That's patreon.com backslash The Shift. Join my news feed on Facebook at The Shift with Doug McKenty. You can join our conversation on Twitter at D McKenty. And for more information and the archives of the show, please check us out at theshiftnow.com. So often on this program, I discuss the serious problems facing society today. Corporate malfeasance, political corruption, and media disinformation are often the topics explored. Today, however, I have the great pleasure of talking about a solution capable of healing the planet while reconnecting the bulk of humanity to the cycles of nature and allowing us to relearn how to live in harmony with the earth. My guest is Marcy Cravat, director of the documentary Dirt Rich, which explores the concept of regenerative farming. This agricultural technique can be used for carbon sequestration, as well as providing a long-term and sustainable form of food production which utilizes natural processes to encourage healthy soil growth. Though the concept of sustainable living is often co-opted by globalist and corporate forces seeking a polished veneer on top of a controlling and even diabolical agenda, Dirt Rich goes deeper, following a cast of scientists, agriculturalists, and activists that gets to the heart of what it means to develop a sustainable civilization in the truest and most authentic form. In this age of corporate agriculture, monocropping, herbicide, pesticide, and fertilizer use, as well as the excessive Plowing techniques that are used are depleting the soil and toxifying the planet at an alarming rate. Some scientists predict there are only 70 harvests left before the bulk of the Earth's fertile topsoils are left barren and depleted. Regenerative regenerative farming has the tools to solve this problem by working with the same principles discovered in nature. This agricultural technique has the power to rebuild healthy soils, reshape rural communities, and reconnect all of humanity through the food we consume each and every day. Here with me to discuss this project is Mary Cravat, the director of Dirt Rich. Thank you for being here, and thank you for helping to make the shift. How are you doing today, Marcy? I'm fine. Thanks so much for having me, Doc. Well, will you tell us just a little bit about yourself and your background, and then get into... um, how you got into wanting to cover regenerative farming as a topic for a documentary. Okay, sure. Um, Well, I am 58 years old. I went to film school when I was in my 40s. And before that, I was a photographer. Mm -hmm. And I also was a stay-at-home mom. So I spent years where I couldn't go on um, photo assignments. And I became a textile designer for a little while. Um, I come from a background, my father was an actor, and he was a circus acrobat with Burt Lancaster, they grew up together. And so I was in and around film and Hollywood and that kind of thing when I was a kid. However, I never thought that I would ever make films. I just never, never seemed like something that was on my radar or even something I had any interest in at all, but I I love taking pictures. So I was a photographer for years and um, I got to thinking that maybe I should go to film school because I had some ideas about things that I wanted to illustrate and draw and write about. And then I realized that they would probably be better as films than as books. And I'm really stronger at the visual manifestation. Mm-hmm. So I went to film school, and mm-hmm. when I got out, um, I made a, my first environmental documentary quite by accident. Um, I was following around an artist who creates uh, statues from live human models, and then he installs them on the ocean floor. And over time, they grow coral, and they're, it, the statues are meant to raise awareness about the coral reef issues, but it's a creative way to sort of like put a gallery in the ocean and have people swim by it and dive by it and so forth. And it was really interesting. But when we were filming, the coral was dying on his statues or not growing at all. Wow. And so when we started to ask questions about that, it became very clear that there were a lot of environmental reasons that this was happening. And so we started to ask questions and we had to bring scientists in because I'm not a scientist. And, you know, I felt 
the responsibility to explore this. So we went ahead and brought in some scientists, Dr. Garreau, Tom Garreau was our key scientist. We also had Sylvia Earle and some others. And we un, you know, unveiled this whole problem with the coral reef demise and the coral reefs are just disappearing like crazy. They're almost all gone. And so while we were filming that, or actually the very last, one of the very last interviews we were doing with Tom Garreau, um, I asked Tom, Tom started to talk a little bit about um, carbon, too much carbon in the air. And I said, well, um, isn't there some kind of a machine or something where we could like suck it out like a vacuum? And he said, yes, we have the perfect machine for that. And it's called a tree. Yeah. And he points <laughs> to this tree. So... Um, I tell this story so many times, so I apologize to people who've heard it before, but it's just, you ask the question, so I have to tell you. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't have, um, you know, I was in the middle of an edit and it was a complicated edit because we hadn't anticipated this becoming a science film. So we had to merge the art and the science and it wasn't easy. Um, and so I just didn't feel like I had enough space in my brain to hear him talk about all of this, but I found it interesting he brought up the term biochar, which I'd never heard of before. He mm -hmm. was bringing up all this carbon talk, which I really didn't even know what he was talking about. But I found it very interesting, and I decided to put it on the back burner, and I decided that when some space freed up um, while we were on the festival tour with Angel Azul, um, that I would start to think about a new film, which is always what seems to happen when you go on the festival tour and you see the fruits of your labor and the reaction that you get to the work that you do, suddenly now you want to start thinking about making a new film, which is this where I'm at right now with Dirt Rich because we're just starting the festival tour. So um, when that time did free up, I got back in touch with Tom again and I said, Tom, could you tell me more about that? And he went on and on and on about biochar. So I thought, okay, well, let's make a film on biochar. We were going to just make a film on biochar. So we found uh, Josiah, who's the guy at the beginning of the film that everybody loves. And we went to Hawaii and just started learning about biochar. But as that happened, you know, it just opened up questions one door after another. And before you know it, I was looking at full blown pal a full-blown palette of strategies of how to pull the carbon out of the air where it doesn't belong and put it back into the soil where it does belong and where it does so much good for every, the whole planet mm -hmm. that I decided to cover all these strategies, regenerative farming being one of them. And in the film, we cover reforestation and wetland restoration and keystone species. You know, we cover the, the gamut of, of these different strategies and within the regenerative farming uh, section, there are just numerous strategies we look at. We look at rock powder and, you know, like you were talking about the monocrops, we look at polycultures, we look at um, mixing agriculture or animals with growing uh, food. We look at crop rotation I and mean, we look at all kinds of things. And um, we have some really colorful people in the film that are very passionate, you know, like about perennial grains, for example, Wes Jackson, he's, the father of the perennial grain movement. And he's really an interesting guy and very metaphorical. And he really brought a lot to the film in terms of metaphor. So I was very appreciative of him. But what I really discovered were that these people were just so passionate about what they do. They all believed in their thing. And I believed in all of them because they were all so passionate about their individual thing. I, I thought, why not just explore all of these? Because ideally, you, as Eric Tonsmeyer explains in his little part of the film, you can't, you need a toolkit, you know, for the land that you manage as a steward, this land that you steward. And every piece of land is very different. Even within a given area, you can have these little microclimates or little situations where you get certain types of, you know, conditions or animal activity or whatever. And so the, the person who is stewarding that land really, really needs to almost become like an artist on the land and really get to know that land holistically and then make the right decisions for that land rather than approaching it um, in the way of um, what do I want to do with the land? It's more like, what does the land want me to do with it? Mm -hmm. And it's a really different way of looking at it, a much healthier way, I think, because 
we tend as humans to dominate the land and do what with it with it what we'd like and unfortunately that means mowing down rainforests and destroying wetlands and all these things that hold so much carbon in the soil and keep the soil living and then we think we don't even value that you know we let it go we don't we don't um make considerate space for the animals that are also sequestering the carbon like the beavers and the prairie dogs um those two keystone species we cover in the film um because they're so important to keeping water on the landscape or managing the carbon under the ground and and they're because they're keystone species they have so many other animals that depend on them including insects for their survival so this is kind of what the film's about it's a bit of a journey film and that's what it was for me and it was so interesting to me to learn these things that my husband and I bought land up in Winters California and um now we are trying our hand at farming that land nice <laughs> Well, that's great that you'd actually take the knowledge that you're gaining from the documentary and you're uh, and you're now applying it to your life. It seemed like from all the interviews that you did in the in the in the film, you could really see that it was a lifestyle for these people and that they were they were really reconnecting uh, with nature. And like you're saying, um, learning from the environment instead of trying to impose their will on the environment. So it was a different kind of uh, a lifestyle, really a paradigm shift. But the uh, the benefits to humanity seem like, I mean, it's beyond just the carbon sequestra sequestration, but it's also, um, you know, rebuilding the forest land, um, Olymp creating food in a way that is not so toxic for the environment and so depleting of the nutrients in the topsoil. Can you talk about some of the problems with um, the corporate agricultural system that so predominates everything today, uh, and then how this film addresses those issues? Um, you know, by bringing up the, these variety of solutions that can help to create a more of a, a sustainable agricultural system overall. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, most people are starting to really grasp the um, the concept that companies like Monsanto and chemical companies like Dow and so forth that are producing these chemical fertilizers and chemical inputs in the form of fungicides, herbicides, um, pesticides um, are really damaging the, the soil so much that the soil is no longer living. It's more or less a prop to put a plant in. Mm -hmm. And so to keep that soil there for the plant, because the soil is not making any of its own nutrition or anything because there's no microbial life in that soil, they're forced and they have to keep putting these chemical inputs in and onto the soil and plants so that the plants will grow. And in order to uh, combat more things, they've come up with the GMO crops, which are just, you know, grown in monocultures, rows and rows and rows of corn, for example, or soy, mostly to feed cattle and that are in um, feedlots, which is also something that I'm very much opposed to. I'm not a vegetarian myself, although I find myself moving more in that direction all the time. Mm -hmm. I've really, really cut back. I am very, very mindful when I do eat meat that it's you know, grass-fed that these animals have had good lives out on the pasture, although I'd like to get to a point where I just wouldn't really need it anymore at all, and I'm, I'm moving towards that. I don't, I understand people are on different, you know, part, they're in, in different places on this issue, but what I think we should all agree on is that it's not okay to destroy the soil to grow these GMO crops that are that require all of these chemical inputs to feed all of this cattle that shouldn't be in feedlots and raised on feedlots. So what does that mean? It means that whatever you grow, be it an animal or a plant, should be grown where it's supposed to grow. So if you're raising animals on open pasture, then that's where you should raise your animals you shouldn't cut down rainforests or forests of any kind anywhere to put in this kind of kind of thing because when you do that you end up destroying um so much of the the soil the carbon gets released up into the atmosphere which is burdensome up in the atmosphere you know we've got over 400 parts of carbon 
per million in the atmosphere right now, and we're supposed to be, um, you know, down at around 240. Uh, mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of carbon that we need to pull out of the air to restabilize and make it safe, safe levels, because it ends up, you know, being processed in the ocean, which is not good. Um, and so, you know, the, you, when you realize that basically you should be growing things where they're supposed to grow, where the conditions are right for growing them, then you can do things regeneratively. But when you try to dominate the land in order to suit what you want, you have to compromise something. Something has to go. And when you start to do that, you upset that very fine balance. And, um, you know, Wes Jack talks about the law of return, that whatever comes from a tree or whatever we grow goes back into the earth. And it's a perfect cycle that, that you, you know, you, when you see a forest, you don't see anybody spraying uh, in a forest, uh, you know, fertilizers. You don't see that in the jungle. Right. Um, you don't see spraying pesticides in the jungle. And, um, you know, there's this perfect balance, this perfect loop of growth and decay. And if you, if you can raise your crops or animals in a way that works within that system, then you don't break that loop. You, you are more mindfully providing food. And, and it's actually very productive from everything that I saw. People get great results with this kind of thing. Um, unfortunately, there are so many farmers that are not interested or willing to make take the time or make the investment. It is costly to, you know, and it's a time investment. I've heard the number of three years to really switch over to an organic regenerative farm. Hmm. But in the long run, you end up getting way, way more and doing a great service for everybody. So that's kind of what the film is pushing. It's um, trying to help people understand that we are part of nature and should not be dominating it. Right. I mean, I guess I did a little bit of a disservice on the introduction, focusing on uh, the regenerative farming part. I guess to me, like everything that you were talking about had to do with how to rebuild the environment so that we can work more in harmony with it. And so much of it has to do with the food that we're actually getting at the end of the day. But there are a, a lots of these different techniques right. that you covered in the documentary that really do talk about like reconnecting more with nature. Where do you see like humanity right now as separate from nature, and and why is it important to to reconnect with it in this way? I mean, can can you just give a kind of a general philosophy behind, um, you know, this theme that's throughout the movie? Well. You know, the philosophy for that, I don't cover in the film. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be <laughs> dealing with that subject in my next film. Mm -hmm. cool. um, it's complicated, you know, the... I think that it basically boils down to greed, money, power. Um, these things drive the agendas that we all make choices to support whether we are aware of that or not. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a subject that gets people very emotional and riled, and a lot of people don't want to have discussion around this kind of thing because once you start to become more aware of this, it requires work and effort to dig through the information. It's not like it's presented on the nightly news, that's for sure. Right. And, um, it starts to open doors from one topic to another. And before you know it, you're down what they call the rabbit hole. Right. And uh, yeah. once you start to learn what you learn when you're down there in that rabbit hole, it's pretty hard to unlearn it when you surface again. And um, so it causes one to start asking all kinds of questions about all kinds of the institutional things we become so trained to believe are right for us mm -hmm. you know in, a, in any in any setting you know, if we're talking uh, the medical industry pharmaceuticals if we're talking the agricultural industry if we're talking politics or war industry um you know the environmental world uh whether we're talking what when we start talking about what's going on with our air and our soil and 
you know, it's just, it, you, you start to see that the choices that we are making, I, I think one of the problems is we, we get so far away from nature through our gadget that, that we become very dependent on. And in doing so, we expose ourselves to a lot of um, electromagnetic fields. We, we, um, we become sort of pineal dead. You know, so we're sure. not really discerning the way we should be. We are more or less complying and buying the the general narrative. Fortunately, the upside of the internet is that it's allowed us to talk like this. I, I mean, you know, we <laughs> couldn't do that before. And yeah. in doing so, we learn we're not alone. And then I think as those is that awareness grows it becomes like frequencies attracting other frequencies and then joining together to vibrate and it increases the field mm -hmm. and when enough people are sort of vibrating at higher frequencies i think the field starts to really grow exponentially and i think that there may be some solutions in there but you really got to have an understanding of how systems work and understanding how systems work is not necessarily pleasant and it's actually shocking and so it makes you really um dig into your psyche and into your you know into your own self and do battle with a lot of the things that you thought were true sure and that's not that's not easy to do <laughs> I'm sure you find that right, and I know you do because I've I've seen the things you've talked about on your show, and you're digging, and yeah, <laughs> it's really important. I think yeah, it's interesting, really, really important. I I just find it so fascinating. I mean, we do talk on this show a lot uh, about alternative concepts and going down the rabbit hole, and it's great to talk to someone like you. I've never really seen someone who went down that rabbit hole from the sustainable agriculture place. You know, so many times maybe people are into economics or they look into the politics of things or they're looking into the vaccine issue um but to go in go in and look at uh sustainable agriculture which i think actually drives to the heart of it i mean as you're discussing i think that the solution here to the system and the powers that be is to reconnect ourselves with the power of nature and learn how to live harmoniously you know, with that, as opposed to living under the dictates of this corporate or maybe imperial system or however you want to describe it. So it's kind of fascinating to see that, right. that, you know, this was the rabbit hole that, that you went down and suddenly you're looking at these, you know, big agricultural corporations and starting to make connections and going, wait a minute, this isn't what's happening. This isn't what I'm being told on the mainstream media, which is probably becoming more and more the biggest focus of my show here with everyone that I do interviews with is coming to that conclusion that the mainstream narrative about a lot of different topics is really designed to misinform you rather, rather than really tell you what's going on. Yes, absolutely. It's intended to misinform you or not inform you. And the intention behind that is to keep us divided so that we remain distracted to a lot of truths mm -hmm. that we would find out if we weren't so brainwashed by the things that they divide us over, which is why we have wars. You know, people think, oh, well, we must really have things to fight about because those politicians know what they're talking about. It's like, no, yeah. <laughs> that's not true. If you, if, you, if you take a look at that, you will see that the brainwashing around that is rampant and so deep. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, in terms of entering mm -hmm. the rabbit hole through the regenerative farming uh, topic, um, quickly, when you start talking about regenerative farming, you, um, you talk also about organic food, because obviously organic is the first step in becoming regenerative. It's not necessarily organic is not always regenerative, but that's one of the first things you do is you start to talk about, um, you know, um, organic food and why it's important to not eat food with the pesticides and so forth. But it's not very far from there that you start asking questions about, say, water. Mm -hmm. And then you find out your water's mm -hmm. fluoridated and it's not good and it's toxic and it's got all these other things in it. And then you start talking about GMO and 
that starts to raise all kinds of questions about why are there GMOs and what are the talking points on GMOs and why do GMO plants, why are they, they designed to resist a lot of the toxins that are in that they're exposed to through the pesticides and so forth. Well, so that their plants won't die, but then who ends up eating the plants, right? You know, either the animals eat them or we eat. So yeah, maybe their plants won't die, but we will. (laughs) And so, and so what ends up happening is you start asking questions. Well, what's the motive there? What's the agenda? Are they doing this for profit? Are they trying to make a medical customer out of us for the rest of our lives so that we're having nothing but health problems that they then throw all their pharmaceuticals at us with? And then that starts to take you over to the pharmaceutical world. And now you start asking questions about that. And when you start going to one, it takes you to another. And it's not very far off before you start looking at really big issues like war. Then you start looking at war, for example. What are a lot of the agendas of, about war? Well, the, a lot of them we're very familiar with. You know, the, the um, weapons manufacturing, the money to be made and putting in oil pipelines. But the, the most recent huge horrid thing that we're learning about war is the human trafficking, the pedophilia that's right. attached to war. You've got all these displaced families and children, people that are in desperate situations, and there's money to be made human trafficking. There's money to be made off of these kids that go into pedophilia. Well, you start down that rabbit hole, and you start finding that there's not only just money to be made, but there's ritual attached to all of this stuff. So now you start looking at who are these people, and what are these rituals, and what are they doing, and why are they doing it? It's like one question after another. And you know, are you, do you stop? Do you stop asking questions? I, I, I guess at some point you can get saturated and think, you know, I can't do this anymore. Or you might fall into a position where you're fearful to ask questions. I mean, look at how many holistic doctors have been murdered. Yeah. You know, a lot. And, you know, or you, um, you know, you start losing friends and, and close, you know, disputes with family members and such. And at some point you have to make a decision about how you're going to handle this and what I'm coming to in my own process and, and everybody's at a different place. But what I'm coming to is uh, I'm starting to develop a real interest in the tools that sort of transmute a lot of this stuff. And so Great. I'm very interested, you know, in this because But you can't go there without an understanding of what's going on. If you try to ignore what's going on or you think you don't need to know because it'll depress you or it will bring your energy level down, well, you know, it is depressing. But think of the people that are suffering these things. I mean, think of people that are in war-torn areas who are being blown to pieces. You know, our discomfort versus their torturous yeah, you know, somewhere we have to learn to have an understanding of what's going on so that we can call out what's wrong and take some responsibility for our choices, even if we don't want to be on the front picket lines. So what I'm finding is for me personally, energetic energetically I'm finding some very interesting topics around how to sort of transmute these things from a more energetic level because I'm tiring of, you know, um, getting tired of the trying to have conversations with people that don't want to have conversations. And right. I feel that sort of hit a bit of a rock wall, which is why I'm so appreciative of your work, because you get out there and you bring the stuff up and you bring people on to talk about these things. And there's so much to be learned from these people. Yeah. And I love your Alana Friedman, yeah. uh, Freeland, um, interview. Um, I mean, this should be common knowledge and it's not common knowledge because it's not on the night news and you know, what's, what's going on here. So, you know, people like you that are out there getting this word out, I just am so appreciative of Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Marcy. I really appreciate that. I mean, as uh, as I appreciate your work, too. I mean, anybody that's creating art or creating, you know, um, 
a medium through which a lot of this information can get out and then get the word out, the better it is. Um, and I think more, you know, more and more people are starting to realize that what they're getting on the corporate news is not really what life is actually is, you know, <laughs> and it does seem to be depressing, but I think, um, I think that, um, I mean, it's certainly gotten a lot easier for me now that if you have a network of like-minded people and I'm really enjoying like doing this show because I get to explore even different ideas and people that are farther down the rabbit hole, maybe than I've been willing to go or, uh, trying to get more of a big picture idea of, of just this whole crazy scene, um, and trying to really figure out what's going on. And I do think that it is, uh, well, I mean, it is a paradigm shift, you know, and it is a um, a spiritual reconnecting, which is why I think that Dirt Rich is an important film, because it is teaching us that the the solutions are there. I mean, these got all the people that you interviewed, you know, they have the science, they have the techniques, they know how to do this. We could be living in this completely different era uh, and instead, we're still continuing to allow these large corporate players to do what they're doing. And one of the things, and we can get into this, and this goes back into the film, is, you know, why are they, like, why do they make these GMOs? Why do they toxify the environment so much? I mean, why they poison, literally are spraying poison on everything, and they don't seem to care about the repercussions, which, you know, come in the form of everybody getting cancer and come in the form of like what you're talking about, ocean acidification, coral reefs are dying. We've just had this big abalone die off up here in uh, Northern California and Oregon and Washington off the coast. I mean, we're, we're watching uh, the Pacific Ocean getting hammered by Fukushima every day. <laughs> and, um, you know, corporate agriculture is a big part of this. Well, no doubt, and they have such power. Um, however, we we give them the power if we choose to support those things. So, one of the one of the um, inspirations I hope people will feel in watching this film is how much better it is to be choosy about what you eat, because then you don't have nearly the amount of health problems and you then don't become a victim of the medical pharmaceutical cabal. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's a, it's, it's, if people just play victim and say, everything's poisonous and I can't make any choices, well, then nothing, then, then there's inaction or there is a reaction. But if people say, I actually have some power in what I can do. I can grow food. I can choose to eat food that is raised uh, the way that I've learned is much better for me. Regeneratively, mm -hmm. it's raised animals raised out in um, pastures and in nature. Um, if people start to connect more with nature so they feel more protective of the forests and the wetlands, which are such important carbon systems and carbon sinks, then the power, the powers that be, well, I mean, I suppose that there are other ways they can keep hammering it at us, but then we need to make choices about the, the new things that we discover. It's like, it's constantly uh, um, an exercise in, in be, becoming more and more aware so that all of the choices that you're making to the best of your ability are going to be better for the collective whole rather than just serving an individual, you know, agenda. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you look at, at agriculture and why they're doing it. I think it's directly tied to the medical pharmaceutical um, world. And, um, you know, some people will say that they, they're trying to keep us as customers and other people will go so far as to say that it's a depopulation agenda. Right. So, you know, where, where people, you know, fall on that on that spectrum is really more or less um, um, the it's the the consequence of what they've exposed themselves to and what they've invested their time in trying to understand. And the more you try to understand, the more questions you have. So it's not like there's any break on this. Right. Um, 
but you also don't want to get submerged in the negativity because then your health is affected as well and your frequencies go down. So you become less effective in sort of transmuting this kind of stuff, in my opinion. I mean, I don't have all the answers by any stretch of the imagination, but I certainly have questions. Yeah, for lots sure. Lots and lots of questions. Well, you know, one of the things I've noticed about uh, uh, as you're, uh, you know, waking up to this uh, uh, alternative or independent way of thinking, this anti-corporate way of thinking, um, <clears throat> you, you definitely start waking up to the fact that the mainstream narratives aren't really correct. What what can you do about it? Um, and I think that the most important thing is to do what you're talking about, to not let it get you down. I, you know, at this point, I've been doing this for long enough that I don't really... I'm not even upset about it. Like, I'm not I'm not very surprised. And I used to get depressed about it. Like, I used to be like, what What the heck is going on? This is insane. You know, I can't believe all the stuff they taught me in school or, you know, all the stuff that they're saying on the news is following this corporatist agenda. Um, but now it's like, of course, rich people are going to take control of the media and then give you some kind of whitewashed version of reality that's, you know, that gets us all to follow along. Uh, with whatever they're talking about. And you can see, uh, you just reminded me that Monsanto, of course, big agriculture was bought out by Bayer. So you're seeing that this there's this odd connection between big ag and, and, and big pharma. <laughs> and it's right there in front of our faces if we can just see what's going on. And I think that, again, going back... It also ties in... Yeah, yeah sorry, Doug, sorry. No, no, Keep go on. ahead. Well, I was going to say it also ties into um, the whole plant medicine topic. Right. And I've been watching this um, series on Gaia Network called Psychedelica. Have you seen that? I haven't checked it out yet, but I should. It's right down my alley. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really interesting. They break down all of the different types of plant medicines, and they refer back to the history and the shamanistic connection mm -hmm. to these and what each plant tries to teach us and tell us and what it will offer and it, it looks at what you can get in terms of benefits but also the the ways it can if it gets in the wrong hands how it can be used for control it's really fascinating interesting and you look at yeah you look at the pharmaceutical industry and you know what they have everybody basically addicted to and then the whole media campaign to make these plant medicines be the devil. And really, you start to take a deeper look at that, and you realize it's not only a threat to the pharmaceutical industry, which is, I think, if I remember correctly, um, that what is the story about prohibition and... I, I, I'm not remembering what I was going to say, but anyhow, the, the medical marijuana thing is, is another one too. You know, it's like mm -hmm. the, the, so many industries don't want us knowing about that, including the, the, you know, alcohol industry, but the prison industry as well. The yeah. prison industry is a big, big industry and they make a lot of money off of people getting thrown in the slammer for doing drugs, the drugs, you know? And so it's, there's this whole psyop about these drugs. And again, it goes to these agendas. And, and when you go even deeper into it, you realize that maybe one of the real reasons they don't want people doing these kind of shamanistic style hallucinogens and things like that is because people's minds expand. They become peaceful. They become very much connected to all being one. And they don't want that. They want us distracted and fighting and they want us um, divided so that we don't pay any attention to all the things going on. You know, it's it's, I think, probably a lot more sinister than just even profit. In other words, I mean, right. we all jump to, oh, they just want to make money. But at some point, they've made all the money they can make. So the what's driving the agendas is something else and something more, something deeper. And that's, you know. Yeah, I think what you were saying earlier about plant medicines being used for control, like so many things actually are a tool, even uh, like my interview with uh, Ilana Freeland, 
about the heart project or this Tesla technology, which obviously could be used to create free energy for humankind. There's so many different, different applications, but these guys take it and they hoard it for themselves and then they use it for control. I think the same thing is true about drugs. They don't want us to have access to plant medicines, but they want to be able to, you know, patent the drug, make it illegal for the rest of us to use them and then sell it themselves in this way that can be used for control. And I'm even, you know, bringing up the psychedelics, thinking about the way the MK Ultra program uh, and some of the intelligence communities did experiments on people about using psychedelics, but using them in this controlling kind of methodology rather than in this mind expanding kind of way, which, uh, you know, some people may have experienced, which helps them to recognize the extent of the brainwashing that's happening. Yeah, that's pretty scary stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty scary stuff. And when you look at how Hollywood is wrapped into all of that, um, and you look at how the music industry is tied into all of that, uh, and the CIA, how they use, you know, these things like MKUltra and so forth, and how it ties into back to the ritualistic pedophilia stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, mm-hmm. these things all start to connect, and it doesn't seem like such a mystery anymore. It really points to the questions about who's in control, who's really in control. Um, you know, when you bring up the media, I mean, basically, we have six companies, isn't it, that own all of the mainstream media. So, of course, the narrative is very, very easy to control. That's not hard to do. It's not hard for them to control it. And, you know, every time you go into an airport or in many restaurants across the United States, they've always got, you know, CNN up. Well, I heard that when they, during the elections, which that's a whole other big Right. Bad issue. (laughs) Um, But, um, you know, they say that the CNN's ratings are up. It's because they've got all of this um, contracting with all these airports and and restaurants everywhere that they're always running. So it always looks like, you know, people are tuning in when, in fact, it's people are seeing it because it's up at at airports. Um, It's disgusting, actually, if you're in an airport, it doesn't matter where you're sitting in that airport. There's another TV just about every time you turn around with CNN or Fox or whatever they've got going. And um, you're just inundated with this brainwashing stuff. And you become so desensitized to the topics that you don't think about them anymore. And you don't, you just kind of like, Ugh, I can't deal with this war stuff. Yeah. Like, well, you know. I I have a hard time with that. It's like, it's easy for us to say while well, we go have our lattes, you know, it's another thing if your house has been blown up and you've got no children left or children have no parents left. And, you know, we need to own up to this. Our tax dollars are paying for this. And um, part of the reality that I think we have to face. And it means turning off that mainstream media because... yeah. There just is not going to be information there that's going to help you gain awareness. It's just not. Yeah, that whole topic of the the war thing, I don't even know how to put it, but why are we constantly at war? Why do we spend so much money on the military? Why are we building these massive weapons of destruction? Um, and then just going around the world and seeing the devastation that's happened in the Middle East with everything that's going on in Yemen right now, even... Uh, what's so interesting in the mainstream media right now where they're talking about this immigration crisis, they're not discussing that so many of these are refugees from either the war on drugs, which you already kind of discussed, but also the Honduran coup from two years ago that, you know, the U.S. completely backed a, a corporate dictator, essentially, and caused uh, the deaths of thousands of people and people are, f- are fleeing from this war zone. Um, caused by American foreign policy. So it's, I don't understand that either. And I, and I, they seem to have neutralized the anti-war movement to such a, a complete degree that it's almost not even a topic of discussion when really, and just to go back to the film, what you're talking about is a, a different kind of lifestyle. We don't need, if we all can live sustainably with locally grown produce that's getting the job done in terms of 
you know, satisfying our basic needs, we, we just have no reason to even involve ourselves in these massive conflicts or uh, I don't even know, like the lifestyle that that was described in Dirt Rich is talking about something that's, you, you know, you're you're um, you're taking care of yourself. You can live off the land, you know, between you and your neighbors and your small communities. I mean, this is one of the things I was envisioning was that that rural communities can really become viable again with these kinds of agricultural techniques where lots of farmers can be using these techniques and you have lots of small farms. Um, going back again to the idea of the personal responsibility where people need to make these choices to buy uh, organic food or food that's been developed in this kind of way and stay away from these big corporations that are pushing this stuff on you that are really just trying to fool you into thinking that what they're doing has anything to do with helping you out in your life, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I totally know what you're saying. And it's it's so true. You know, when we were in uh, Panama filming, um, it was kind of interesting, this story about their cashew nuts. Um, you know, they export cashew nuts in little bags or in bigger bags, but you just get the little bags on the airplane. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can see in any convenience store, they've got the bags of the cashew nuts. And as we started asking questions about the cashew nuts, it turns out that so many people just have a cashew nut in their yard, just happen to have one in their front or backyard. So what they do is they bag up their cashew nuts that they pick themselves and they put the bag out like you put out your trash. Oh, yeah. And the cashew nut factory comes around with the truck, <laughs> picks up the bags of cashew nuts and makes, you know, payment to those people for their cashew nuts. Wow. And then they take the cashews to the factory and they bag them and export them. And if you just think about, you know, gardening in that way where you might have lemon trees and, you know, your neighbor doesn't have lemon trees. There are so many creative ways that you could, um, you know, organize the production of food in any given neighborhood. It could be a street or it could be a, a, a neighborhood. And, you know, we don't do it. And instead, you know, we, and then, you know, the other thing too, that I think there's the growing of food, but there's also the growing of soil. So mm -hmm. we all mm -hmm. eat these foods and we have the peelings from the vegetables or fruits that we eat. We have um, the old tea bags and the coffee grounds and all these things. They all make fantastic compost. And, you know, if everybody was doing, uh, saving this stuff and just putting it out in their yard in a pile with their leaf clippings or bush clippings or whatever, they would have soil once a year to put on their garden. So if you let it just sit there, you don't have to do anything. It just becomes compost after some time. You can do it more quickly if you're really good at it. But if you don't want to be bothered with turning it and all that, just leave it there and it'll turn into soil. And then come springtime, when it's time to fertilize your garden, you don't have to go buy anything. You just take the compost from your own you know, piles around your yard, if you have a place to do that, and you, um, you put it all over your plants, and your plants love it, they give you more apples, more blossoms, more everything, and mm -hmm. then storing mm -hmm. carbon as well. And these urban gardens, our, our backyard gardens, are really the perfect example of the way to grow a polyculture, because nobody grows rows and rows of one crop in their yard. Everybody's got a tree and a rose bush and some flowers and maybe some fruit and some vegetables and whatever bushes they want and whatever. They combine what they like. That's a polyculture. And so now you've got all these plants helping each other out and they're all doing their little thing. And the ones that you can tell if they're happy, they grow. And if they don't, they die. So you just put in something else and see if it works. And if it works, they're, they're a good companion. And now you've got this carbon sequestering little piece of land. And you're sort of helping store carbon and pull the car pulling the carbon out of the air, putting it back in the soil so that the soil becomes living. Now you've got bugs and insects and microbes and fungi all living in your soil. I mean, it's really pretty interesting and it's it's pretty right there. The solutions are right there in front of us, you know. So right. you know, doesn't make a lot of sense to not do them. Well, and the other thing is again, uh, you know, as I try to I try to get um, get through in the introduction is this idea of reconnecting with the natural cycles of things and learning to live with nature 
uh, in order to make our lives easier, actually. Like, and again, this stuff is right in front of our face. Um, I remember in the movie when you're talking about the keystone species and you're talking about the beavers and like, how nice would it be to have beavers helping us control, <laughs> you know, instead of all these artificial dams and these concrete reservoirs that we're building, that's actually depleting the water resources. Uh, the beavers were doing that naturally for years. And we have to bring this back. Like we need to learn how to live with the beaver. We need to, uh, another part of the film was the rotational grazing where you're actually integrating your cattle or your horse herd or whatever you've got in with um, your, your wheat crop and your fur, you know, you're going back and forth and you're fertilizing your crops that way and feeding the animals. Um, I mean, this is the way that the prairies grew for millions and millions and millions of years before humans started doing all of this monocropping. And it just seems like it makes so much sense to reconnect in this way, learn from the cycles of nature, you know, make your own compost, have your own backyard garden. And then suddenly you're living a totally different lifestyle. You're living more sustainably, but emotionally on that frequency level that you were talking about earlier, you're connected with the whole world around you and what you're putting into your body, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think you become you become happier and you sure. you then there's more goodness shared rather than competition and things that are not so pleasant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you talk about the prairie, it's actually really interesting. Um, you know, the we used to have a lot of buffalo on the prairie and the buffalo would be chased along by wolves or, you know, animals that would want to eat the buffalo. And so the buffalo would keep moving along. They'd never stay in one spot. Plus they move away from their own dung and urine. They just keep moving. So what are these buffalo doing as they're moving across the prairie? Well, they're, they're actually fertilizing the prairie with their dung and urine, but they're also keeping the grasses mowed down to just enough to stimulate regrowth of mm -hmm. new grass. And But they don't overdo it because they get pushed along by those wolves that are on their tail and they keep moving. And then when they circle back around and come the next season, the grasses have all grown again. And from what I understand, the grasses grow in three levels, short, medium, and tall. And you need all three of them to have healthy grass pasture. Interesting. And the buffalo, yeah, the buffalo, as they move about, they trim the grasses just enough to keep those three grasses in balance and keep them stimulated. So we've killed so many of the buffalo and they aren't doing that so much anymore. So some of the, the thought around having uh, domestic cattle like it we show in the film is to sort of uh, take the place of that herbivore, that, that bison or buffalo that mm -hmm. used to do that by moving the cattle around from paddock to paddock. And we show how to do that. Now you need pasture for that. That can't happen in a feedlot. So the feedlots just need to go. I mean, they're, yeah. they're bad in every way. They're, they're feeding their animals GMO crops that are grown in monocultures all over the Midwest that are sprayed with herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, and commercial fertilizers. We don't even eat that stuff. We send it down there for the cattle and, and the, you know, the animals being raised in the feedlot. They trample all that soil till it's nothing but powdery dirt. But worst of all, they live horribly you know, horrible lives where they suffer a lot. And that matters. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's probably mm -hmm. the thing for me personally that gets me the most is why would we not have more appreciation for the animal that we're going to eat, you know, if we have to do that? And where did we get off thinking that they're just a beast that can be treated like that and killed? That's just, it's just wrong. There's nothing about it that's right. And so the feedlots, they just, you know, and then they've got the whole antibiotic thing too that happens at the feedlots mm -hmm. and the animals get sick and they shoot them up with the antibiotics or they shoot them up with antibiotics or other things to fatten them or whatever. They've got all the things they do with all their pharmaceuticals. It's just bad news. And so what does that mean? Well, there's only so much pasture around the world. And that's where we should be raising our pasture animals. So does that mean that we should 
lessen our meat consumption or not eat meat at all, yeah, that's what it means. It means we should only be living within the means of what we can supply. So rather than saying, well, I'm going to dominate that and open up a feedlot, I think the better way to look at it is, well, what can we do holistically and in the right way? And if after that, we need to like think of something else to eat. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't just keep utilizing nature as some sort of a um like it's there just for our taking it's it's that's not you know we're part of the natural system as well we're animals as well we need to work within the in concert with the the natural systems yeah i mean this is just the change that's got to happen it's really the reason why i call the show the shift is because this is the shift that needs to happen what you're talking about is you know this disconnect between us and our food. And I, it's so central when you're getting meat that was grown on a feedlot or in a CAFO or one of these situations. Um, it's like you're, you're being disassociated from the suffering and the pain that that animal went through. And you're not, you know, like, you're not, you're just not connected. You're disconnected from, from what's actually happening. It's, you know, people just have no respect for the natural world, I think. And then it leaves, I, I, so many people have this and they don't even realize that I think there's a part of themselves that's missing. And it's a part that people need to get back and have in their hearts that we're connected to these animals, we're connected to the food that we eat, and we need to care how this stuff is produced because then it goes into our bodies and it affects us on this deeper energetic level. If you're eating uh, an animal from a feedlot or a CAFO that lived a life of suffering, is that you know, as opposed to an animal that was raised in an open pasture that was grass fed, that had a, a great life and then was slaughtered with some with some respect for the life that was being taken and for the sacrifice that it was giving so that we can live. We feel a connection with what's going on. Um, it's just central to the change that needs to happen and amazing that that so many people have been blocked off from this part of themselves. You know, it's too bad. It, I, I, I've actually come to look at the this whole kind of movement that we're talking about as one of a healing process. I think in the movie you talk about, um, gosh, what was the term? Geotherapy. It was on your website in the, in the introduction um, or in the description of the movie. Geotherapy. I mean, what a great term. And we all need to go through this kind of therapy. I mean, this disconnect that we're talking about is a result of the trauma ourselves of being raised in such a controlled environment, I think. And then we need to be healing. If the more healthy we become emotionally, the more naturally we're going to want to reconnect with the earth. We're going to start to work towards healing the earth. I mean, this is the transformation that needs to happen, I think, for, for us to get out of this toxic environment, you know? <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. And one of the things I tried to show in the film, we spent quite some time at the beginning of the film with Josiah's kids. And the reason, you know, people say, why are you, you know, why did you put so much of the kids in there? I did that because these kids are like, you know, his son, mm -hmm. uh, Noah, is like Mowgli from the Jungle Book. You know, he's climbing <laughs> up trees and picking coconuts and dragging racks of coconuts. And he's out with his clippers and bringing food in the house and, and you know, very obviously connected to the land. Yeah. And lives on a farm yeah. and goes out and does the work and understands how things work on his farm, his dad's farm. And I noticed even when the kids were playing with their Legos in, you know, I, I don't know if people catch this in the film, but even when they're playing with their Legos, they're making little farms out of their Legos. They've got little cows and carrots and things like this. It's like their orientation is around nature. Mm -hmm. And then when Wes Jackson talks about, he, he, Wes really wanted to talk about more sort of um, kind of esoteric subjects, not just what are perennial grains and why do we need perennial grains. He's bored of answering those questions. Mm -hmm. He's done so many interviews and mm -hmm. this is what he, what he does. He wanted to talk about how we are connected to how how we should not compartmentalize our, our connection to nature. So, you know, he talks about how, um, you know, when they teach a certain subject at school, why is it so separate from the connection it makes to nature? Um, in other words, if you're going to teach a, a chemistry class, he says, well, is there any place in your class for the chemistry of, say, bread making? Right. 
Um, you know, he, he wants there to be, you know, questions that might not necessarily have answers, but at least that you're asking. And so metaphorically, I, I really looked for opportunity in the film to show how nature does have answers for us. And at the end of the film, you know, you see the kids putting the, the mud masks on their skin while Wes is talking about this very subject. Right. And, and, and so back to having the kids in the film, you know, I felt very compelled to show their lifestyle because they weren't sitting in front of iPhones or iPads and they were um, not texting and they were out in nature, uh, fishing and collecting fruit and playing on top of biochar piles. And, and then at the end of the film, you look at Willie Smith's, who's another one that really inspired me in that way. And his whole connection are orangutans. Mm -hmm. You know, he fell in love with orangutans mm -hmm. at a very young age. And because he saw what was happening to them, he wanted to regrow their forests for them. That was what got him all into that. He wanted to be the one to save the orangutans by making sure they had forest. And you see this passion in his eyes and, and you see how much these animals mean to him. And then you realize, boy, when you, when you have a, a real passion for nature, you protect it. And you learn to work very respectfully within that system. And I think that's what you're talking about. I think you're talking about how we need to get back to that. And I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there's there got to be some kind of a connection that so many of us are missing that we get back if we want to start to like turn this ship around and get on a long term trajectory that's sustainable that can actually I mean, that 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 notion that comes up in the film of 70 harvests left. Um, one of the things I was going to bring up when you were talking about the uh, the buffalo I think that on the prairies in North America, at one time, there was some 30 feet of incredible topsoil that had been produced by the years and years and years of the buffalo herd going up and down in this way. Um, and now they're talking about 70 years left uh, of arable land that can actually function to feed the planet um, because of these big agricultural techniques that aren't working. So, unless we make some kind of drastic change, um, you know, we're counting our days. <laughs> I know it's a psychological kind of trick in a way, because when you see, um, so many rows of something growing, you think abundance, you think, mm -hmm. wow, look at all of this corn growing. This is really prolific, but you don't realize, you know, that it's actually doing so much damage and that there's so much soil erosion and that there's no life in that soil, that it's literally dirt. And, you know, you were talking about the topsoil from the buffalo and, and you know, also to mention are what those prairie dogs are doing under the ground. Yeah, down there. sure. You know, they're putting that earth around and tunnels just going for as wide as you can see, or at least they used to where they're moving that earth and all of that water that rains and goes down there gets spread, all the minerals that come from the rivers, from the rock powders that grind through the glacial grinding come down through the rivers and go into those holes and get redistributed all underneath the ground there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many things going on with all this and you've got all the insects that go in there and do that. There are a lot of very interesting keystone species. We only touched on two, but like the dung beetle is another one that goes moving the earth around and doing, moving, you know, the dung around. And, it, you know, we just don't realize. And I think people are becoming more aware, like they're aware of bees. People are starting to understand that we need bees and bees are dying off. Right. I don't think they necessarily want to talk about all the reasons why they're dying off. Um, but they are dying off. And, uh, you know, I don't think our air is doing them any favors these days. Yeah. And, um, not to mention glyphosate and everything that, you know, is sprayed on the fields. So, you know, between aerosol emissions and, and um, um, you know, the, all of the, not the poisons that are sprayed on the land, how can we expect things to stay healthy and alive? It's like, it's, it's imperative that people wake up and ask questions um, because we are all dependent 
on ha- everybody contributing to the solution, or at least as many people as we can get to sort of fulfill the hundredth monkey type thing, you know, where there are enough people that yeah. understand what's going on, actual shift in paradigm can actually happen. Yeah, I have this feeling that there's a lot of people kind of in the woodwork that know what we're talking about. Um, and, and yet it's still like there's a little bit of, of self-censorship. Well, I think there's a lot of self-censorship that goes on. People are afraid to discuss certain topics out in the open. Um, but I think that there could be easily a straw that breaks the camel's back that starts to bring a lot of people out and say, yeah, we've had enough. You know, this is crazy. We don't need to live like this anymore. And um, at any time, you know, with every person that starts to wake up to the manipulation that's happening with the mainstream media and starts to watch more informative documentaries and start to realize that there's a different way out there that we know how to do it even. I mean, that's what's amazing. It's not going to take some incredible scientific discovery to save the planet. It's like we have them right here. We just need to start living this yeah. way. <laughs> yeah, so it's a matter of choice, really, because mm-hmm. you're right. The answers are there. And in fact, the the information's all there, too, about all these things. It's right out in plain sight. It's just a question of do you take the time to get to know it? And, and then when you do know it, now you can make an informed choice. And none of us are perfect, and none of us are going to make perfect choices all day long. But you can start saying... I really need that plastic, um, you know, wrapped, whatever. Can I get it in another way where it's not in plastic? You should start. So maybe you change 20% of your choices around plastic or 30% or 50%. That all adds up. And, you know, if people stop buying the GMO processed foods, then those companies are not making the money and they're going to have to adapt. Yeah. And I I suppose they're going to have to adapt. (laughs) That's that's probably, that's probably optimistic, (laughs) but, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, it, it really has to start to become, what can I do rather than how am I going to get my leaders to do this differently? Right. It's, it's just not working anymore. And we saw that in the last election. Um, so, you know, thinking you're going to get in there and change it from within, ugh, good luck with that. You know, it's like, um, that's pretty mobbed up that whole scene. And so, you know, maybe I don't know the solution, but, you know, it's got to come from like, you know, what's that little song people sing? Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. That's, that's true. Yeah. Right. There you that's go. What has to happen. It does take uh, individual choices. I mean, if people didn't buy GMO food, then Monsanto couldn't get away with it anymore. And I know that, you know, these, unfortunately, the methodology of control is to try to make it the only thing that's available. (laughs) Um, You know, you can see that the way that... That's pretty pretty scary. Yeah. The way that they hoard the seed stock and they patent their seeds and they try to get everybody to do the seeds and they try to get all the organic, uh, you know, uh, seeds off the market. Um, or make it, I mean, I, I, in California right now, I think seed swaps are actually illegal. Or if you swap seeds more than a mile from your house or something like that, it's ridiculous that they actually, really? even, yeah, they try to, they try to make it very difficult for people wow. to, um, to do this kind of lifestyle that we're talking about, you know, this kind of individual self-sustaining, uh, uh, having the ability to take care of yourself, feed yourself, doing it in a way that works with the cycles of nature that doesn't disrupt the natural cycles. Um, it's actually yeah. challenging. They don't want you to do rain catchment. A lot of times they're trying to say that, you know, the government owns the rain. And if you're catching the rain, then you're, you know, stealing from the government kind of thing. And I mean, just amazing that we have this, this ability and this knowledge. Yeah. They really pump the scarcity thing too. Mm-hmm. the scarcity narrative, um, mm-hmm. gets pumped big time. So we don't have enough water. We don't have, you know, um, it's a fear, fear-based narrative. Um, Deborah Tavares has done some pretty interesting videos on the water um, topic and how we are um, 
sort of meant to believe that we're drawing our water from primary source water when in fact we're drawing our water from secondary source water, that primary source water is the deep water and the deep aquifers, hmm. and secondary source water is the atmospheric water that rains and goes into the reservoirs. Well, those, those, all of that can be controlled. And when it's controlled, it's controlled about how much is given out or what you know, what the rules are about who gets the water, but it's also controlled by what they put in the water. So they can fluoridate the water and people are then subjected to whatever's in the water. Yeah. And then they spin it as, oh, tooth decay is something you really need to fear and we're putting fluoride in the water to help combat tooth decay. Well, um, I mean, from everything I've read, the fluoride is pretty toxic. And, um, you know, the amounts of toxins we're exposed to build up in our bodies. In fact, personally, I had my hair analyzed and my toxic metals were off the chart. Wow. And yeah. And as is probably everybody. Yeah. Well, I think we all need to do that. That's a great idea. Yeah. So I did that. I got the, um, I, what I did was I, I participated in an online metal, heavy metal detox summit that Wendy Myers put on through the Sophia Institute, um, which is Dr. Dietrich Klinghart's Institute. And he's the expert on detoxing metals. In fact, he would be an excellent person for you to have on your show. Yeah. He's super interesting. Okay. Anyway, so um, Dr. Dietrich Klinghart, um, you know, he's, he's very um, aware of what these metals do to our bodies and how they build up they cross in the blood brain barrier and they store in our brain. So a lot of the testing is not even very accurate because it's not, it's testing what's loose and in our system when in fact it's being stored in our brains and you can't really test that. Um, you can see other signifiers that your metals might, your metal counts might be high because you are not absorbing say calcium and magnesium the way you should, because the receptors have been damaged from all the heavy metals, which hmm. are stored up in your brain. But um, another interesting thing I, I learned about that is that when we sleep at night, our brains actually shrink a lot so that the space, they, what's that word, interdistal, I can never remember the word, but the space between all the little connecting little wires in the brain right. becomes much wider. And so what happens is this lymphatic fluid, and I don't mean lymphatic, I mean glymphatic goes through and washes your brain while you're sleeping. Wow. And it washes away this toxin. But when you have too many heavy metals, it causes inflammation. And then your brain can't properly shrink at night when you're sleeping to allow that lymphatic fluid to wash away those toxins. And what happens then? You end up with diseases like Parkinson's and, and Alzheimer's. And those things they don't test for until after, you know, when pe people have passed. And so it's not super easy to, to test for this stuff. But if your calcium and magnesium levels are really high, it means that you're not absorbing it. And that's what they found. So she was telling me, oh, you're very high in barium or was it strontium? Where do you think that's coming from? And, yeah. <laughs> you know, very high in aluminum and all these different things. So I'm on a detox diet um, regimen. It's a regimen. And um, basically, it's going to be two years to hope for any results. And it's going to be lifelong commitment because you it's like turning the bathtub water on at the same time you have the drain going. You've got you know, it's coming in as fast as it's going out. Wow. So it really becomes a lifestyle change. And it's not easy to just up and change the way you live your life. But I'm working into it and working out some of these heavy metals. Um, so I'm not sure how I started on that. Something you said about that made me think about that. Um, but, you know, we are one of the things I will say that is synergistic with heavy metals is glyphosate. Now, glyphosate's the main Roundup type poison that they spray all over the fields. Well, that glyphosate in conjunction with the aluminum makes it exponentially more dangerous. And it's so hard to get it out of your system. These doctors that specialize just in glyphosate say the best thing about to do with glyphosate is don't expose yourself in the first place because it's really hard to get out of your body. Huh. It's not impossible and it can be done. 
but it takes a lot of regimen. And um, everybody's very different about the way they process things. So what may work for one person may not work for another, and then they might have to try something else. So um, these doctors that were at this heavy metal summit, they talked about all of this. And I was just like mouth dropped down, you know, aghast at how many toxins we are exposed to through the air, the soil, our food system. Um, through vaccines, through um, just, you know, our water. And it, it's like, it's really easy to get kind of overwhelmed and then just say, oh, I, I can't deal with this. But I suggest take it a step at a time and try and, you know, make a different choice about, say, the water you drink. That's a good first step. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a complicated first step because then you don't want it to be in plastic and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like it's always another thing. So you have to kind of put your work in. So I'll make it easy on you. You can get glass bottled water from Mountain Spring, which is um, uh, out of Arkansas. Um, and you can have it delivered to your house. The bottles are really heavy. It takes two people to put one on to your stand. So it's not the most convenient thing in the world. But at least you're drinking water that doesn't have all that stuff in it and it's not stored in plastic, which is also problematic, not only for you, but for the environment, you know, and for the animals that live in the environment, in the ocean, for example, and are having to deal with those plastic gyres that are floating around, you know, in the middle of the ocean. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it just never ends, Doug. It's like, it's one thing after another. And I think what you said about just getting closer to nature just eliminates so many of these problems. So if you can just kind of think about good farm living, um, even if you live in a city, uh, you can grow some sprouts on your counter and your neighbor might grow something in their yard. I've I've just got up on my deck potatoes growing and they're growing really well and just some salt bags. You know, there are ways to, to, to try and grow some food or go to your local farmer's market or your local natural health food store and try and make good choices, I guess. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot there. What you talked about in terms of, I think how the, you know, whatever you call them, the corporate elite are creating this system of scarcity where you have to go to them and you have to buy this toxic stuff. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I, it's interesting we talk about, I mean, is there a depopulation agenda? It certainly seems like after the end of these 70 harvests that we have left, there's going to be one and they don't seem to care about, you know, trying to find a, a more sustainable or long-term way to feed the 7 billion people. But, um, you know, in terms of the seeds or the food or even the water, I think it's hard for people to imagine that that a group of people would try and create an artificially scarce environment off of, you know, water that should be so plentiful that everyone has plenty of water. And yet they're, I mean, I think maybe that's part of the reason why they're, they're so toxic is they toxify uh, so much of the, of the freshwater sources that are easy to get to so that people have to start buying bottled water. I think that, that that's even, uh, you know, what you just said is, is based on an understanding that there is a, even a global elite, which mm-hmm. a lot of people are not there, there either or think that that's just simply not true. And it's not even that they don't believe it, but they don't buy that at all. You know, there's no way that that's the way the world works. Right. And um, so, you know, this is why I keep coming back to um, – there's responsibility in becoming aware because when you learn one thing, it takes you to the next thing and you have to sift through that information yourself and you've got to figure out what you resonate with and what you don't resonate with because it's really easy. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I've noticed is that even, um, you know, groups of people that I trust for their information, put out information that it's just, I don't agree with. So then, what do you do? Throw the baby out the bathwater? Uh, I don't think that's a good idea. I think it's better to take what you can get from that information and then figure out where you're going to go to um, learn and grow from that point mm-hmm. and maybe not put all your eggs in one basket. Um, 
this is happening with a little bit with the geoengineering um, community is that they are um, talking about um, how the global warming agenda was created and that they're co-opting it to sort of come in and save the day by doing solar radiation management so that we don't have so much global warming. And, you know, they're talking about how horrible it is that we are being blamed for our fossil fuel, which I understand we don't really have fossil fuels, but anyway, fossil fuel, um, you know, use is the, is to what's to blame for the global warming. Well, they get off on that topic, which always gets under my skin because mm -hmm. what it ends up doing is it, it, it lessens one's need to take responsibility for what we are doing to the planet. And we are as human beings, a huge, huge headache for this planet. You know, we are using up and damaging the planet in a way that's never happened before, I don't think, because of industrialization and where we are with technology. And um, so saying that we're not responsible and we've been, you know, sort of the global warming message has been co-opted so that they have an excuse to do solar radiation management that bothers me a little bit. It's not that I don't think that they don't co-opt messages mm -hmm. and that they haven't co-opted that one. They certainly have. And I do think there's a big part of it that they've created this global warming thing. But there also is truth that the planet is heating up. And there is tr that it's absolutely true that we have too much carbon in our atmosphere. And it's absolutely true that we don't need that carbon in our atmosphere. In fact, it does damage. We need it in our soil. It's absolutely true that our soils are depleted. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be real careful, you know, when you get the information to say, well, like, slow down. Let's take a better look at all of the ins and outs of that argument. And, you know, it's difficult because then you get into arguments with people and they want you to be all about their way of thinking about it and it's complicated you know and then if you start going even deeper down the rabbit hole you start getting into even bigger topics you know around galactic issues and things so it's like you know um i i don't advocate that anybody um you know i i don't i don't pretend that there's some sort of owner's manual that we get mm -hmm. you know that says here are all these truths I think it's it's a it's a journey and that everybody's truths are going to be based on their experiences and their curiosities and what they feel like they resonate with and all of that combines to a collective consciousness so some basic understandings about things about you know thoughts being energy or actions that we take or energy if we all kind of agree on some basic things we can have differences in the way we think, but those things will protect us because we won't be so quick to make the kind of choice that would hurt somebody else because we don't believe in that, right. you know? And that's sort of what I gather when you talk about a shift. I, I, I interpret that as a shift in consciousness about the way we behave as thinking, living beings, and that, you know, how we do that we have to respect that that has an effect on other living things. And I'm talking about every living thing from rocks to, you know, humans to whatever, and, you know, everything in between. And so I really like this idea of shifting. And I don't think that's going to come from the leaders that we elect. I just don't think it's going to happen. I think it has to come from us. Yeah, I can't agree more. I mean, I think what you were talking about earlier is everybody making individual choices uh, that then support this broader community and then the broader community can build and build. It's It's got to be a grassroots effort. I mean, the system is so powerful and uh, like you were describing, changing the system from within I just don't see it happening. I mean, I don't see somebody being able to take control of this. I mean, I think there's something about the system that's just the problem. Like we need to, <laughs> you know, we need to somehow think about our communities and our real interpersonal relationships a lot more than this 
larger political thing that theoretically can make choices for us or make better choices that will affect us all. Uh, I don't see it coming, especially since you can see all of the um, all of the corporate money that goes into you know manufacturing the laws that are made by by the governments, and I just can't see anyone getting up in there that can actually make any real change to all of this without not without some sort of mass movement that's already happening that's you know driving the change that's for sure so and also yeah i think that all of oh sorry go ahead doug sorry don't mean to interrupt well i was just gonna say again you know yeah starting with um starting with this cleansing that you're talking you know people need to detox um, the environment is so toxic. And if you make the individual choice to detox, then you, you know, you can get rid of that brain fog and you can start to think a little more clearly and you can make better choices for yourself. Um, this is a real, really serious. I mean, maybe this is part of what they're doing. They're toxifying us so completely that we just don't have the brain power to, you know, to fight them anymore. <laughs> yeah. I think that that's really true. I personally think that, um, I don't think a lot of people think that, but that's, I think that that's mm -hmm. what I think is happening. And I also think we're so conditioned to believing in our institutions, for example, the educational institution. Um, you know, I think it's very, very important to look at what we are taught in schools and to really, really not fall into the trap that the educated have all the answers because the educated a lot of times are the most brainwashed of all because they've spent the most time in the system learning something. Now, I'm not saying education is bad at all. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that you have to look at these things with discerning eyes and a discerning feeling inside mm -hmm. because just because it comes in the package of education does not mean it's true. I mean, I look at the way we believe the history that we've been taught right? and it's a bunch of, you know, and so it's like, you go back and learn the right stories of, or something closer to a right story. And you're shocked that it's not what you were taught in school, you know? And so you have to be really careful. There's the, the, you know, the educational industry, the, the medical industry, the agricultural industry, you've got so many, the political, the legal, you know, there are the prison complex. You've got so many things that, we get indoctrinated into believing our truths. Another big one is science. Um, mm -hmm. You know, science in its pure form is great, but science these days, just because it's a scientist or because it's a published scientific paper, I don't know that I'd be so quick to just jump on, oh, it was, you know, it might be true, but science is also very flawed. Yeah. You know, what gets published is very political and um and there's a lot of science that doesn't report their results in order to keep the certain belief system in place and they're paid off or they uh don't get the funding that they need to do the studies or they get murdered or uh, i mean there are all kinds of things that happen and so just because it's in the name of science, you know, I would be careful with that. And I would also be careful where science stops because science is pretty good at compartmentalizing things. And then they want proof before they'll make statements beyond that when your intuition tells you that there's more to that story. And these days, I don't know why evidence is not important in the scientific world or the legal world, to be honest, the way it used to be. I mean, I remember when my parents sat around watching those Watergate hearings because of some audio tapes. Yet mm -hmm. WikiLeaks has released all of this email information, and people just don't look at it. Yeah. They just don't look at it. And the media doesn't do the job because the, the investigative reporting just doesn't exist anymore. And the ones that do do it get censored. And then the legal system steps in to make sure that there are all these laws that that monitor what you're doing, what you're censoring, what you're saying, what they, they can censor, what you're saying. And then those that are speaking the truth end up, you know, their 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 readership or their viewership goes down or they aren't allowed to post anymore or they disappear or whatever. And it's like there are actual laws in place that protect 
so that that can happen now. You know, the mm -hmm. Obama passed a bunch of those before he, a couple of them before he left office. And um, like the National Defense Authorization Act, you know, or, you know, you can't, you can get thrown in jail without having a trial. I mean, all, you have to look at how all of these systems connect. And then you have to ask the question, well, what's running this? What, what is it? Because it all dovetails so nicely with each other. But people just don't want to go there. They don't want to make those connections because it's too scary to not believe what we've been taught. Mm -hmm. And then what ends up happening is there's inaction, which is why we have wars and things, or there's reaction. And they're just fear-based. And I think it's better to be have action based on what you believe inside. And th those beliefs should be constantly worked on and constantly um, reevaluated because I don't think we're going to come up with a, like a, 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 an owner's manual with a bunch of answers in it. There's, you know, just everything really depends on the situation and individual and collective consciousness, all kinds of things. It's, it's very, very um, unique to each situation. So it requires work. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to do that work. Yeah, it, it, it is. And that's the only way that the shift is going to actually be able to happen or this paradigm shift that we're talking about is for people to decide that they need to do that work. Um, and, and it does take an effort on people's part they can't you can't just be inactive and accept the lifestyle that's been handed to you by this external system right now because it's too harmful it's too toxic right you know one mm -hmm. of the things i was i was going to say you were, when you were discussing global warming earlier you know it's almost like i think i distrust the topic of global warming primarily because the mainstream narrative pushes it not not i don't know you know, I think pollution is bad. <laughs> I don't want to see, you know, all of this toxic waste being dumped into the atmosphere. And I'm sure that it harms the planet and whatever, wherever people align with that. But the way that they promote the narrative in the mainstream media, I don't think is really correct. And it's, it's caused the entire environmental movement to go in the direction of fighting climate change. Whereas I think what we and what we've been discussing for the last two hours and or hour and a half and what you're really getting into in Dirt Rich is this notion of toxicity. People need to come to wake up to the idea that this civilization, the way that things are being run by this current system is just toxic. It's toxic for us. It's toxic for the planet. And it's not going to last much longer. I mean, even if you... You know, if you're a global warming skeptic or if you're not concerned about the CO2 in the atmosphere, I mean, certainly, you know, breathing in the air pollution in the cities with cars driving by all the time. Or I think the ocean acidification, which you made reference to with the, all the coral reefs dying, this is caused by high CO2 levels now in the ocean. This is a big deal. You can't kill you know, all this life in the yeah, ocean yeah. with the CO2. And it's like nobody really discusses that. These are poisons and toxins that are being released into the atmosphere by our lifestyle and one person at a time i think we have to make that choice to make the lifestyle change to no longer ingest these toxins by supporting our local organic and regenerative farmers and detox ourselves so we can get these heavy metals out of our brains so we can start to think like rational human beings you know <laughs> Yeah, I think you're so right. And I think you are right to question the global warming narrative. Um, I think that there are truths and non-truths in that. And when mm -hmm. the mainstream media is pushing something, I think it's a huge clue to be paying attention to the, the, the reason that it's being pushed. And so um, I, you know, I, I think it's good to be skeptical like that. And, um, and, you know, regarding the, the oceans, um, you know, in our film Angel Azul, we really covered that. Um, the sea, the oceans, a lot of what's killing the coral reef is the temperatures, the temperatures of the ocean, hmm. and um, as well as the acidification and overfishing and all kinds of things are contributing. And, and one that we take a good look at in Angel Azul is pollution being um, released into the aquifer systems that get out into the ocean and mm -hmm. kill the coral reefs through the algae blooms that happen. Right. And we really cover that a lot. 
Um, so again, we have this impact on the planet with everything we do, um, with the way we take and with what we give, put back. And I think understanding the way the physical systems work, um, you know, Tom Garo mentioned that in our film Dirt Rich, he said, um, you know, kids aren't taught the natural systems. They should be learning this, you know, about these um, plants and biology of plants and so forth in elementary school. And, you know, it's so true. It, it, the, these things don't come across at early ages. So kids don't necessarily develop an appreciation for these systems. You know, if, if the educational slant was different and, you know, we weren't so focused on, um, you know, producing test takers that, you know, it, the whole educational system is just another whole story. Um, but, you know, we would, and, and misinforming, you know, through bad history lessons and things that are just not true, if we were to get more to the core of things, I think people would feel a lot more empowered to um, trust themselves. And they're not conditioned or raised to trust themselves. They're conditioned and raised to trust what they've been taught. That's really different. It's really different. And then, you know, rules get put on us and rules I think are more or less there to control as opposed to say guidelines that kind of empower more. Sure. And I would like to see more empowerment of young minds that are still kind of innocent and curious and willing to believe things that as adults we would never buy, you know? Because I think that there's there's a lot there and, and a lot to be learned. Um, so yeah, we have a long way to go, but I, I do, I do agree with you that some of the first steps would be to get ourselves physically healthy by eating right, making good food choices and detoxifying so that we decalcify those pineal glands that are, you know, manufacturing the melatonin that helps us have a good night's sleep so that our brains can clean and clear out or that mm -hmm. are crystalline in their structure so that we are more able to pick up extra sensory perception type things that help us get a feeling about something or discern something or our intuition becomes more, um, you know, active. And, um, and then, you know, we then start gravitating towards tools that work, you know, towards cool fun stuff that yeah. works like sound therapy or meditation or you know um crystal talk about crystals and rocks and what you you know it gets into all kinds of really interesting stuff and all of that stuff is like good you know it's like it feels good it feels very considerate of everybody else mm -hmm. it feels like a sort of a basic understanding that we're all one kind of thing and i think that's a way healthier way to go than the way that we are programmed to go for the purpose of keeping certain people rich and powerful. And that's taking it to a certain level. There's levels that go beyond that. That's that, you know, it seems like the most obvious. Yeah. That's what I think. I mean, I, you know, I, I struggle myself in my personal relationships and all of this, you know, I, people get sick and tired of what I think. And, um, I end up feeling guilty and bad about it. Then I, you know, try to rein in a little bit, but I don't feel that doing that for very long is a good idea because I really feel that personally for me, I want to be part of raising collective consciousness. It's just what I want to do. I don't expect everybody else to do that, but I would like to have a little bit more expectation about people taking responsibility for becoming aware at least because at least when you're aware you don't buy everything that you're told and then even if you don't act on it and even if you want to remain quiet at least your consciousness is operating at a different level that that i think brings benefit to us all i that might sound a little woo woo but that's the way i feel <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I think it's right on. I, and I, it is interesting, like the, I don't know, you know, a few years ago, if you'd have said something like that, I would have thought it was more, more woo woo, but now I'm starting to see that there's a, a kind of a method, um, to this other way of thinking that's more connected with the way our feelings work. And that being connected in that way is just a healthier and happier outlook on life being, being detoxified, not engaging in this 
sort of competitive or authoritarian uh, society that we're kind of born into and and asked to accept as normal when uh, there are these other options. And, and I hope that more and more people start to wake up to them, because as you say, then just having that awareness to make better choices, um, that starts to make a really big difference. The more people that do that, then the more people that can follow their feelings and make a good choice. Um, you know, the, the more things are going to change in a good way for everybody. So I definitely appreciate that sentiment. Yeah. I. We're getting a little over, over an hour and a half now. I had, um, well, one more question, I guess, and then maybe we can wrap it up. Cause I know a lot of people just getting back into the idea of regenerative farming, you know, they'll say that, um, well, there's no way the world has 7 billion people and we have to have this big agricultural system set up to be able to feed everyone. There's no way these small scale farms could actually be able to handle that. And if you, in your travels with this documentary, you know, did you discuss that with any of these people? How can we create? Um, yeah, you know, that comes up. In the, yeah. Well, yeah, it, it comes up in the film. Oh, sorry. Well, I just want to make a follow up to that and connect it with this idea of scarcity versus abundance, where we've talked about scarcity. You know, can we have a feeling of abundance instead of this feeling of scarcity that we're sort of, I think, c constantly and purposefully oppressed with by the current system using this, these kinds of techniques and getting back to nature? Can we actually feel, you know, get to getting to a place where we feel like we have enough and we're not scared that we don't have enough and we're not constantly scurrying around trying to get more, you know? <laughs> Right, right, right. Um, it is addressed in our film, uh, not in a lengthy way, rather quickly during a conversation between Tom Newmark and Larry Kopal. They um, are having lunch in Costa Rica around a table and discussing this idea of what actually feeds the world. And um, if I remember what they say, and I might not have this right, so I'd have to go back and watch exactly what they say, but I think they say that. Um, smallholder farms are responsible for feeding the world hmm. and that um, that they're already doing that and that the vast amount of that acreage that you see is going to feed the animals that end up in the feedlots. So the idea then becomes, well, what to do with that vast acreage of, say, Midwest farmland that's growing rows and rows of corn or soy or whatever that are being sprayed with all those inputs. Um, so there is talk about bringing it back to its natural state, but at the same time, having a lot of smaller urban farms that are growing these polycultures, which are actually way more productive in feeding the world than the farms that we think are feeding the world, but are really just feeding the animals in the feedlot. Huh. Um, so there's a big misconception about this and it, and it, and it does drive a lot of contention between vegans and, you know, meat eaters. Um, the vegans are very, very, um, and I'm not making any judgment here on vegan. In fact, I think if the world was vegan, it would be a better place. But having said that, I'm not a vegan. Um, and so I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, that I'm taking sides here, but I think the idea that, we're trying to get across in dirt rich. It's, it's how you raise and, and grow your food and that there is enough for everybody. It's just that you might not get to have meat every night. Right. You know, like there isn't enough. If everybody ate meat the way Americans eat meat, no, there's not enough pasture land to properly raise the meat to provide that kind of meat quantity. Mm -hmm. So the choices have yeah. to become different. So you can't really have that much meat in your diet. So what if you start deciding to replace X amount of days a week without meat with something else, you make a huge impact on the environment. And if you are cautious about only buying grass fed, grass finished meat, then you, the demand for grass fed meat is going to outweigh the, you know, the, the feedlot meat. People are going to say, I don't want that anymore mm -hmm. and I'm not going to buy it. But then they also have to be responsible about not overeating the meat because we don't want the rainforest or other places mowed down to put in pasture. Where pasture naturally exists is where we should have pasture animals. 
So it's a balance. And, um, and I think that there is enough for everybody. Uh, according to the Deborah Tavares and the water issue, the planet's never been wetter. And if you go down deep enough for your water, there's plenty of water. She would be another good one to have on to talk mm -hmm. about that subject on primary and secondary water source. It's very, very interesting. Um, and so uh, I, I think that this, like most things, a lot of this scarcity thing is a, is a, is a contrived, um, it's a contrived message that's meant to keep us on alert so that we buy the other messages that they pump and that come out of the mainstream media. So yeah, what the mainstream media is saying, I would almost want to question just about anything they say, Yeah, you know, um, because if they're pumping it hard, um, there's a good chance that there's a real, real agenda driven reason for it, in my opinion. And so I would never get my information personally from the mainstream media. I don't look at any of it, none of it. I don't read any of those papers, New York Times, none of that. I've basically become the same way. I used to, uh, I used to go through and get the mainstream article and get the independent article and compare sources and try to figure it out. And eventually, I realized that the the independently produced articles were always actual investigative journalism, and the mainstream narrative, it was always, as you're saying, it was agenda driven by somebody. Some something is somebody, some group creating a, a big narrative in order to. You know, convince the population of a particular worldview or that a particular issue needs to be framed in this context and not looked at in other ways. Um, so I've gotten I've gotten really sketchy about it after doing a lot of research to try to see, you know, what was going on. I've kind of realized that yeah, this is not whatever's going on with the mainstream media is not actually informing you of the truth. There's something going on behind the scenes. Um, that's that's. Uh, driving some kind of, I think, social engineering, creating um, some kind of, of manufactured consent is a great term for it, I think, to, to just continue the status quo without really thinking too much about it. So, I was going to just say that it's also important to be constantly, um, you know, vigilant about alternative media as well. You really have sure. to pay attention to the possibility of co-opting and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So just that little... Well, and I'm just going to do uh, one last question about what are your thoughts for your next project? You said that you're kind of already on the uh, on the uh, awards tour for Dirt Rich. So what are you thinking about doing next? Um, I'm in the research stage right now for my next film, and I'm trying to expose myself to as much of the... Um, necessary exposure and the transmuting of tools, transmuting tools for the things that I feel I've, I've spent enough time exposing myself to, like I want to move to the next stage. So again, it will be a solutions oriented film. Um, and, you know, I'll be exploring, I haven't decided yet exactly which tools, how far I'm going to go with it, but I'm currently, uh, actively exploring. And so, um, I listen to all kinds of videos constantly. Um, I'm very fascinated with what's going on with the secret space program. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm very fascinated with, um, uh, sort of this raising of frequency type stuff. I'm very fascinated with it. Um, but again, I'm really interested in getting to solutions. And um, so my film will somehow focus on solutions, but it won't be without going through some of the darkness to sort of get to a place where solutions can be discussed because I, it's really hard to call something out or to um, make a choice about something when you don't understand what's going on. It's just impossible. It's like that with disease too. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just, you know, mm -hmm. have a disease and you go get a pill for it, you're not really um, um, curing the 
the other parts of what contribute to the disease, which are the spiritual and the mind components of disease. And so if you really want to heal from disease, I think you've got to go to those places to um, understand what your solutions are for that particular problem. And that's, you know, the way I think it is for all problems. And so I'm interested in always in solutions um, because I, you know, they somebody, I can't remember who said this, but something about the people that have the most hope are the ones that are the something about conspiracy theorists or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Those are the people that actually end up having the most hope. Sure. Because they put themselves through the torture of learning all what's going on and then coming to terms with it and being angry. It's like it's almost like grieving. You go through these stages yeah. <laughs> and how was I so fooled and and am I still being fooled? And what parts of me are being fooled? And yeah. and how am I gonna know? Yeah. And you ask yourself all these questions and you never really get any for sure answer you you start to sort of connect to other like minds and you start to sort of formulate more of a consensus about what you feel but you always know that there's the possibility that you're wrong right and that you've been fooled once again and so it's a constant process of sort of exploring and being humble at the same time but also being kind of um I don't want to say, um, you know, assertive, you've got to be a combination of all those. So you're like walking this line between, um, how much do I expose something and how much do I focus on solutions mm -hmm. without degrading myself or taxing my health too much. Um, and so I want the next film to somehow walk that line. And I don't really feel like I'm quite there yet, but I'm getting kind of close. Um, I'm actually going to start filming uh, my first thing in September and it'll probably be like the other films where I think the film's going to be about something and then I come across more information and it turns into something else. Sure. Cause that's what happened with both of my films. Right. Um, part, part of first the one was supposed to just be about an artist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see where it goes, but that's kind of, kind of where I'm headed right now. Well, excellent. I'll be looking forward to seeing it. That's for sure. Um, do you have a website for people to go to some contact information if somebody wants to go check out the movie? Sure. Um, the website is www.dirtrichthemovie.com. That's one way to get into it. Or you can go straight to Pass Along Pictures, which is our um, uh, production company where you can see a trailer for Angel Azul as well. And Pass Along is um, King Arthur's horse. Uh, that's named after King Arthur's horse. And it's spelled P as in Paul, A-S-S-E-L-A-N-D, like dog, E, uh, passalonpictures.com. So you can go there too. And they'll link back and forth anyway, even if you go to Dirt Rich, the movie.com or Angel Azul, the movie.com, they all link together. So. All right, great. Yeah, I recommend that people check it out for sure. Um, and I would just like to take a moment here at the end to remind people that if they are liking what they're hearing and they feel like supporting my work, they can go to uh, Patreon. Become a patron at patreon.com backslash the shift. Um, you can join my news feed on Facebook at the shift with Doug McKenty. Join the conversation on Twitter at D McKenty. And for more information about the show, please check out my website at theshiftnow.com. And I want to thank everybody for listening. And thank you so much, Marcy, for being on the show. And thanks for your work. Really appreciate it. And really looking forward to the next film. I like, I, I'm looking forward to seeing your evolution. Uh, now that you've gone down this rabbit hole and see what happens as you come out the other end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Doug. And I really, really want to say again how much I appreciate your work. It's so important. And I, I love seeing your interviews. And I just really appreciate you putting yourself out there and doing them. Awesome. Thank and you. And I look forward to interviewing you too there, mister. So. <laughs> All right. Yeah, let's do it. I'd love it. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Doug. Thanks, Marcy. Have a great day. Thanks again. Bye.